Let's see if this comes up. Waiting. Yep, streams just come through now. Feel free to mute everyone on, on, on Zoom from now on if you want. All right, so the stream is up. Yep, stream's working just fine, Grant. Okay, good evening everybody in YouTube. This is the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group. Coming through the Ham Radio DX channel tonight. Ladies and gentlemen here in the hall, if you'd like to take your seats, we are live. So just give us a minute to get organised. We're very new to doing this, so apologies everybody in YouTube land if we goof up slightly. We'll uh, see how we go. So at this stage I think I'd like to introduce um, Ivan uh, Vujic, VK2 uh, VK VK5 RS. <laughs> Uh, who's going to speak with us this evening about extended SSB and what it sounds like and why do it. Over to you, Ivan. Can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Okay. Well, um, good evening, everybody. Um, locally here and via Zoom and via Hayden's YouTube channel. Um, in front of the um, uh, A-Reg tonight, we're going to present um, a very interesting topic. Um, and it's regarding the extended SSB audio um, for the applications or still the amateur radio um, setups. So um, before um, I get into what I think it's an appropriate level for for amateur radio application, I just need to um, put a bit of a disclaimer out there that um, audio engineering is a very complex subject and. Uh, um, the intended purpose of this presentation is not to uh, do a deep dive into explaining um, every single component throughout the chain and um, how we um, convert it into the radio input and onto the airwaves, but simply to give you a, a broad overview of, of, of the subject and to um, um, get you familiar, familiarized with the um, extended SSB audio. All right, so let's get started. So what is um, ESSB? ESSB is any J3E SSB transmission um, that exceeds the audio bandwidth of standard traditional 2.9 kilohertz um, SSB um, mode. And you might ask why three kilohertz plus? I'll get um, to that in, uh, in one of my um, next slides. The reason, the main reason for the extended bandwidth is that um, the bandwidth is um, directly related to the clarity um, and required for the clean and articulate vocal audio. And some facts about the SSB. Um, ESSB, um, a lot of people refer to it as a ESSB hi-fi sound, which is a bit um, contradicting considering that the hi-fi term on its own refers to the 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz um, bandwidth. Um, but um, I think that uh, the flat frequency response with extremely lo low total harmonic distortion and good signal to low um, characteristics is what the um, ESSB is all about. Amateur radio transmissions. Um, ESSB or, F or AM for that matter, um, hardly qualify for anything reassembling the true high fidelity audio. Um, I've heard a lot of abbreviations regarding the E into the ESSB. Some people refer to it as uh, extended, some people refer to it as, a, as, a, as a enhanced uh, or expanded. Um, and I think that the only um, correct one is um, extended single sideband. While, and, and uh, let me explain this, the, the, uh, the normal SSB transition, uh, transmission, let's say the 2.4 kilohertz can still be um, enhanced with some uh, external EQing and signal processing, but for the intended purpose it's not extended because it doesn't um, satisfy the required bandwidth to support the um, high fidelity uh, audio that's required. And are there any benefits, are there any real benefits to the 
i5, we got something wrong there, okay? Are there any benefits to the ESSB um, uh, transmission or reception? My apologies, just one second, a few technical issues. So we're back. Apologies for the interruption. Um, yeah, so we were talking about the, the benefits of the um, ESSB in terms of the um, transmission and reception. ESSB um, has many benefits. The most noticeable being a very pleasant, um, highly defined sound, not inherent with traditional SSB audio. Also, it only occupies one half of the bandwidth that required by the AM the same for the same audio quality, since SSB is a single side suppressed carrier mode versus the AM, which is the double single side with carrier mode, and it's there, therefore a more efficient signal and less subjected to the phasing and selected fading problems inherent with the AM counterpart. The history of ESSB, while experimentation with ESSB has been recorded since the single sideband has been um, um, discovered or introduced, um, the e early stages of the ESSB in the modern era um, um, date back to the early 90s um, and the origins are going back to the America. It should be noted that the single most driving force behind the initial SSB audio experimentation was Bill Salerno, uh, W2ONV, or as he used to refer to himself, one nice voice. Silent key, unfortunately. He was often referred to as the godfather of the SSB audio, um, and for a good reason. Um, the initial group um, was um, catching up um, daily on, um, on 20 meters, um, obviously doing some, doing various testing and, um, and um, um, testing different modes and different equipment. It's worth noting that uh, back in those days, um, the transceivers out of the box were not exactly the same as they are today. So some um, modifications were required in order to um, satisfy the, uh, uh, the bandwidth uh, required. Um, another very important figure in the uh, e um, ESSB scene was John um, NU9N, who I have contacted um, to obtain a permission to uh, use some of his website contest uh, for this presentation. A very nice guy and very knowledgeable guy in terms of the um, ESB audio. Um, and uh, you can find a lot of useful information on his website, which is novemberuniform9november.com. I call this a resistance phase. So obviously that group that was earlier mentioned that was catching up daily on 14178 in the United States in the in the early 90s um, came up to uh, was facing some um, uh, resistance from the from the other band um, users. Uh, there was a lot of people complaining about the um, was it really necessary to transmit four kilohertz wide and above for the communication purposes. And uh, there was a couple of petitions uh, being signed in America, um, I think in 2003, and they were filed with FCC. Um, but those are operators uh, in attempt to ban such experimentation. Um, the, the attempts failed. The FCC made the decision in all cases, and I think there was two of them that were failed officially, one by ARRL and one, by, um, one with FCC. With FCC. Um, the, um, the the both both of them were were, were um, declined and uh, no changes have been made to the uh, allowed uh, bandwidth in terms of the SSB um, transitions transmissions. Uh, so that was the petitions in 2003 and 2005. Um, is SSB legal? 
a lot of people would ask that question. Um, and I think that people, the reason why people are asking this question not um, because they uh, um, they want to be seen as a, as, a, as a pain, but because they perhaps didn't know. Um, so this is um, applicable to the um, Australian um, operators. So this is out of um, Australian LCD, uh, License Conditions Determinations. So, um, um, and by definition, any emission mode with a necessary bandwidth not greater than eight kilohertz um, is allowed um, on our bands, referring to VK, of course. Um, so ESSB is um, no different to um, somebody trying to uh, transmit AM in the middle of the band, um, or CW, or you know whatever that is. CW is not really a wide um, um, mode as, as such, but I'm just taking it as an example. So it's just another 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 um, segment of the um, amateur radio um, hobby. And why three kilohertz plus qualifying criteria? Well, um, high frequency audio above three kilohertz supports significant difference in clarity. Um, more suitable um, frequencies above three kilohertz are more suitable for reproduction of natural energy found in a human voice. Um, most of our consonants of human speech, such as S, T, K, and Z, are all above three kilohertz. Human ear is most sensitive at 3.3 K. Intelligibility of the speech decreases with decreasing bandwidth. Um, and in terms of the bandwidth, this is um, what it looks like in terms of um, setting it up on your on your transceiver. So you got um, the fundamental frequency at the bottom and the end frequency at the at the, at the top. And uh, the difference between them two is your total bandwidth, of course. And you'll notice that oh, I would say that 2.6 or 2.8k, that's the reason why I put them up there, would be the most um, used bandwidths in um, everyday SSB transmissions, the most commonly used, um, I would say. So when you do um, a roll up um, on a band with 4.5k um, bandwidth, or uh, God forbid 6k, um, people will be asking you questions. <laughs> um, what are you doing? How do you um, how do you monitor and how do you prepare your audio um, to suit desired um, desired uh, TX bandwidth? Well, most it's important to mention that most um, radio monitoring circuits are not good enough um, to give you a true representation of your audio. Um, the the way that I have found I found works the best for me is if I just get the um, the signal straight off of, of my um, radio antenna port into a, let's say, an SDR receiver, um, and then monitor, record it, and and play with it afterwards. So, in in terms of um, um, monitoring and preparing my um, audio um, and checking the quality of the of of the mix, um, what I do is um, you'll see that on a picture there a little box. Um, I think some people refer to it as a sa sampling port or a sniffer port or something like that. So that, that one actually provides minus 55 dB of attenuation. Um, so antenna goes into the one of the S239s and the other S239 goes, 239 goes into the dummy load and then I take the uh, little SMA into the SDR receiver to monitor the transmission. On the uh, SDR end I've got another 35 dB attenuator. So, um, um, and I found that to be the most accurate uh, in terms of getting the true representation of what you will sound on air. Um, and then I import that into my um, um, audio um, DAW, uh, Digital Audio Workstation, uh, and there's many of them that you, you could potentially be using. Um, and uh, and uh, if you remember the previous graph that I mentioned about the, the bandwidth and the starting and ending frequency, so that's uh, that's what you can um, uh, measure on that um, graph that you out of the EQ that you have uh, um, uh, sampled um, out of your antenna port, and that was indeed one of my um, one of my um, um, audio setups or one of my audio presets, should I call them? Um, so you can see um, all the picks and troughs and and the total bandwidth, and where do you cut, and and how aggressively do you cut it? 
In terms of the um, um, ESSB setup, and uh, it all starts with the with a microphone, of course. And uh, a disclaimer there at the bottom, as you can see, credit card warning. So you've been warned. <laughs> this can get very expensive. Um, so I've seen people um, with very expensive gear having an, an average um, audio quality. And on the other side of the spectrum, I've seen people with a very uh, like the bottom end in terms of the price um, gear, but set up properly with the amazing audio. So there's not really um, hard and fast rules in terms of um, what you're going to achieve with the with the equipment that you buy. Uh, most definitely, um, I would say that Neumann microphone is definitely better than the uh, uh, than a hundred dollar Presonus one that you see on the left there. Um, in in all aspects, um, dynamic range, frequency response. Um, the the polar pattern, you know, whatever you want to com compare them, um, they're definitely going to be chalk and cheese. But again, horses for courses, and be warned, these these toys are very expensive. Um, just as a reference, um, some of the, uh, the very popular ones um, out there amongst the um, ESSP community would probably be the um, Electro Voice RE20, the one on the far right hand side. Um, that microphone has been an industry standard in the broadcasting industry, not sp not particularly related to uh, to um, amateur radio alone, but the actual radio broadcast um, for decades. That microphone was first introduced in 1962, and it's still selling uh, today, so it's not a discontinued model. Um, uh, the the Shure SM7B in the middle, um, and uh, for the reference, that that electro voice that I mentioned there before is around about around about eight to nine hundred Australian dollars. Um, um, the Shure SM7B, same price range, um, I would say uh, mid-range um, uh, microphone, um, and then you go on the far left, uh, Presonus PD70, very recently uh, released, so it's a it's a newcomer to the market but with some very spectacular results and a lot of people are praising that product. Uh, we're not going to talk about the two middle ones, the, the Neumann and the Neumann, because they cost uh, over 5,000 Australian dollars and I think that they would be an overkill for the ESSB. They'll be more suitable for the um, recording industry and the studio applications. Um, radio. Okay, so a lot of you would remember this rig. Um, what is it called? Um, something SDX. Um, it's this was the ultimate choice um, back in the back in the nineties, um, and this radio was well. First, it, it was um, capable of doing some um, DSP, digital signal processing. And second of all, it was doing 4K out of the box, so referring to 4 kilohertz wide transmission without any modification. Um, needless to say, um, ESSB people are, didn't settle for the 4K, so a lot of them have done some mods um, to uh, extend it to uh, a 6 plus K. Um, and a very popular group for that era was the uh, the Voodoo Labs or the Voodoo, Voodoo Audio Labs uh, group. Um, that was uh, coming up with a lot of uh, modifications um, for the rigs of that era. Um, so definitely you would have seen or heard a few of them in the uh, mid to late 90s um, on air. Um, so I would say every uh, single audio lover in terms of the SSB would have, would have had one of them. ESSB rigs of the uh, modern era, in terms of the conventional radios, um, ICOM unfortunately um, does not um, support, and look, I, I could be wrong, but mo most of the ICOMs that I've, I've played with, um, the, the best I could have got out of them was 2.9 kilohertz in terms of the TS bandwidth. Um, I could expand that by brute force uh, to probably about 3, uh, 3.1 max. And when I say brute force, referring to the external processing and, uh, and really um, pumping up some hard audio into it, um, but that would be the absolute maximum that I've seen on, on 7300, for example, 7610. Um, so I haven't, haven't had a um, pleasure of playing with the more expensive um, ICOMs um, um, from their range. 
Um, Yesu on the other side has been um, um, very popular um, lately, I would say within the last 10, 10, 15 years within the ESSB community due to the um, wide um, TX ability um, out of the box. Um, and a lot of people are uh, referring to the color of the sound they, they're getting out of the um, Yesus, that warm tube sound. Uh, more spe I'm specifically referring here to the um, FT5000. Um, that's 4K out of the box, um, FTDX 101, um, um, both Delta and, and Mike Papa, uh, 4K out of the box. And of course, um, Cambwoods um, traditionally support the wide TS bandwidth and it still remains popular within the ESSB circles. And that was the my brief overview of the, the conven conventional rigs. In terms of the um, um, software-defined radios, um, some major changes um, are noticed in the ESSB community since the introduction of the modern um, SDR transceivers. Most of them would do 10 kilohertz bandwidth out of the box, no um, no modifications uh, whatsoever. Um, and I've experienced this myself with uh, with NN and the um, Expert Electronics, and also on a uh, on a few friends of mine that have flex radios. Um, so uh, really really popular. Um, um, and growing in popularity in terms of the ESSB um, use. Um, and a lot of, and, and but they are, on the other hand, um, chalk and cheese compared to the uh, conventional radios. Very different to set up, very different to, to operate. But a lot of these uh, modern SDRs, you probably don't, wouldn't need to put um, so much effort into external processing in order to achieve the desired um, audio quality because a lot of them have built in. Um, voice processors that are quite good. All right, now we're getting to uh, some frequencies um, and uh, how we explain them. So you you you'll you'll hear a lot of people um, talking about um, the frequencies of the human voice, um, and this is just a, a very brief explanation of the most popular ones and um, what do they mean, and what can you do with the certain ranges. So 75 hertz to 200 hertz is your your heaviness and your rumble. Um, I'm not going to use the B word. Um, so 200 to 300 hertz is your bass um, and then and, and the sense of bigness. Um, 400 to 600 hertz is uh, chesty boxy sound. Um, 600 to 1K is volume. And then the most important one for me is uh, 2000 uh, to 4000 hertz or 2 to 4k which is the clarity um, 3 to 5k is presence and 10 10k is uh, the airy sound a lot of people and look i'm i'm one of them as well i'm very new to the essb um i've been playing with essb for probably um, last year and i have um, gone uh, I've definitely experienced the full circle. I've started with, with one component in my rack. At uh, my best, I had about eight different components processing the audio before it was fed to the radio. And um, there's a lot of things to learn. And uh, by no stretch of imagination have I learned um, all of it. Um, so a lot of people um, um, are asking the question, you know, should I cut or should I boost in terms of obviously referring to these frequencies over there. EQing the uh, EQing the signal is uh, is one of the most important parts of um, any audio setup, um, and the same thing applies for the um, extended ESSB. You will notice that if you um, um, uh, search the forums or you know ask people that are um, uh, knowledgeable about you know audio engineering, that a lot of them prefer cuts versus boosts. Um, boosting, um, the most simplest way that I can um, explain this, um, for example, a muddy sound can be cleared up by boosting the high frequencies, but that is not um, a solution that's going to fix your problem, that's just a patch. Um, so boosting the highs, yeah, will, will cover up the, the muddy mids, um, but it's not going to fix up your problem. So you will notice, and there's something that I've definitely learned from uh, my experience so far, that cutting is definitely um, uh, much more efficient in terms of the the voice clarity opposed to boosting um, but and I'm not sure why we all 
um, kind of tend to uh, boost more than cut. That's just the human nature, I would say. But um, so far, I've, I've, I've managed to convert my mind to say, well, okay, wha what can I cut instead of what can I boost? And the results are amazing. Um, and where to start? Um, for the interesting ones, the people that are interested in in doing um, some um, ESSB experimentation. Well, I think I mentioned this a few times before. Um, the picture you see here is is one of one of my rack setups, um, and we got the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven components, or well, six really. The last one is the sound card. Um, there are no hard and fast rules. The very simple, the, the simplest um, form of processing the audio um, and feeding it into the radio would probably be a channel strip. Channel strip, you can, you can see that the, fir the very first component up there, and that's something that's uh, it's a bit of a legendary component in in in, in, um, in radio broadcasting industry. It's called Symmetrix, um, and that model is five two eight. There's also a six two eight. Um, they are no longer manufactured. Um, and they're hard to find, but if you can find one, grab it. They're worth every single dollar. Um, they're not very expensive, by the way. And um, that why they call channel strip. They call channel strip because they give you um, the 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 entire um, channel setup in one com component. So that particular component has um, microphone preamp. Um, it has downward expander. Um, has compressor and it's got an EQ. So that's for somebody that's interested in starting up with ESSB will probably be um, more than enough in terms of um, processing audio um, to fit into a radio and get a very decent sound. And this does not apply um, solely to ESSB. You know, if there are people who are not interested in wide transmission. They c you can be still doing your 2.4, 2.6, 2.8, you know, whatever. But you know, obviously, you wanna if you wanna sound a bit better, that's the way to do it. And in terms of um, feeding the audio to the uh, to to your radio, um, uh, so far the experience tells me that um, the front end of the radio should be avoided at all costs because there's some circuitry uh, that needs to be bypassed, and you can do that by feeding the audio from the back. Um, which has resulted in much cleaner uh, um, sound and a better dynamic range. Um, and of course, I need to mention that um, I do have a particular friend who runs um, a software setup, so he doesn't have the uh, uh, the knobs and dials. Um, he has got his entire ESP setup done on a computer. Um, which you can do again very easily nowadays with the DAWs and all the available plugins um, that are that are um, easily accessible um, on on the internet. Some of them cost a lot of money, um, but you can do a good job with the free ones as well um, if you know what you're looking for. Okay, so um, I think that. I'm not going to um, uh, dwell too much on the on the on the setup tips, but from the experience, um, the most important things that um, I've found are the um, um, the microphone is obviously the the number one thing. This is where you start. Microphone should be connected using a balance um, connection, balance cable, and don't try to cut corners on cables. Um, this is very important. Uh, good shielded cable um, is not cheap um, but it's it's worth it's worth the investment um, also um, for the people that are interested in in, f in processing audio and feeding it into the uh, radio I need to mention um, I put in brackets there don't forget audio transformer I need to mention the fact that the um, all pro studio gear referring to the rack components uh, by default, plus four dBU on the output um, in terms of the um, output um, level. Um, what we need for the radio input is about minus 40 dB. So there's a, there's a bit of a difference there. So if you are to plug 
um, uh, the output of the symmetrics that you've seen on the on the previous slide directly to the radio. It's not going to be a good thing. <laughs> you could be damaging something, or definitely not going to be sounding very well. So that needs to that um, needs to be attenuated a lot. And uh, there are various um, suppliers out there that provide the um, the audio transformers. Um, noise reduction is 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 the other thing that I've noticed because the um, the mics are uh, normally very hot because of all the external processing and you can they'll you'll be amazed with what sort of noises they'll they'll pick up so um, and also the shakes can sometimes be a very noisy environment where you've got the amplifiers running you've got the fans um, and all sorts of noisy equipment um, hum um, is normally so before I go on to the next thing, so the noise can be dealt with with the, um, either the noise gate or the downward expander. Um, one of them two will uh, you can set it up so that you'll cut off all the noise between the set between um, uh, at certain level, so the the background noise is all el eliminated and your voice can still be processed without interruption. Um, hum in um, in a, in audio transmission is normally um, introduced um, by uh, ground loops or bed cabling and um, the harm is um, uh, and it could be prohibited by um, correct connection between the different sound process equipment this is what I was referring to before with the uh, uh, quality cables as well as the filtering um, we already um, spoke about the um, AGC um, well, we didn't spoke about AGC. We spoke about EQ um, and and AGC. Um, we all know what AGC is, auto gain control. Um, I don't need to spend a lot of time um, explaining that. Um, AGC is designed to change the input gain in a way that um, overall signal level of the recorded voice is uh, nearly constant. So it rides the gain uh, is the typical term you're, you're going to hear. Um, the, the AGC can reduce or increase the signal level. Um, uh, compression on the other side, uh, which is not on a slide there, is uh, doing completely opposite. So you need to be careful that, that you're not um, pushing those um, conflicting um, operations too much in opposite ends um, as you're going to run into problems. Um, in terms of the signal process flow, um, and again, there's no um, um, hard and fast rules about this, but this is what I would say um, a very um, average um, 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 voice processing rack would consist of. So of course you've got a microphone, then you're going to feed the mic into your microphone preamp. Out of the microphone preamp you've got to um, obviously put a, some sort of gate or limiter in there to deal with those noises we mentioned earlier. Um, out of that, you're gonna EQ your voice, uh, compress it, and uh, put a bit of color onto it with with some effects such as reverb, and then fit it into the into the radio. This is a very debatable subject. Um, a lot of people would ask, you know, do you do you compress before? Do you compress first and then EQ, or do you EQ first and then compress? Um, so, I personally. I like to have um, the, my gate or limiter straight after the microphone preamp because that means that all the, the unwanted noises um, are eliminated right at the front and I like to do my EQ straight after that. The reason why I like to do the EQ is because the compression can um, affect the, the EQ, especially if, you, if you're running a, a broadband compressor. Um, and I'm not going to get um, too deep into the compression, but there's various compressors out there, and there are some compressors that will do multi bands, so you can you can set up different parameters for the lows, mids, and highs, and and how you c how they compress each segment individually, or you can have just a, a cheaper compressor that just you know um, compresses the entire um, spectrum at once. And why is that a problem? Is that you know if you especially in ESSB setups, a lot of ESSB people. Um, like the bottom end, um, so you'll notice um, a, a, a lot of heavy bottom end in terms of the bass, and when that bottom end hits the compressor, that's what triggers the compression to to start its process. 
which means that sometimes the high end escapes um, the process unprocessed, if that makes sense. Um, and I obviously mentioned the uh, um, obviously the on the output. Um, oh, before I go to the output, the reverb. Um, reverb um, is um, one of those effects that you know I I don't think I'll be able to uh, imagine my setup with without one um, now because I'm so used to it. Um, but without it, um, it sounds like you're talking to a pillow. It's uh, it's very um, uh, muffled um, sound, and the reverb um, gives it that um, um, increased presence and a bit of a airiness um, in your transmission. But you got to be careful with reverb. You <laughs> you don't want to sound like 1980 CB operators. Uh, it's uh, it, and, and no no disrespect to the CBs, but um, it's just uh, too much reverb will, will will sound horrible. So it needs to be it needs to be the the right amount of the reverb. Um, and again, I've always I've already um, mentioned the um, audio transformer on the end of the um, um, output from the rack uh, going into the um, radio, which is very important um, considering the difference between the output and the input required for the radio. All right, so the limitations of um, ESSB. Limit first limitation of ESSB is for, and again referring to Australian users, would be the power. Um, as we all know, we are in Australia we are limited to 400 watts PEP. Um, USA users, for example, can well have access to 1.5 kilowatts. Um, majority of the population um, that will would listen um, to your transmission would either not know what you are on about, or you will sound very horrible to them because they're receiving a 2.4 k. And, and they, that their receiver is not really trans, trans, um, not really presenting your hard work in terms of the audio they're going to hear on the other end. Um, receive quality uh, is mainly dependent on a single strength. Um, in order to hear the um, high fidelity sound, you would need to be receiving the, um, the my signal, let's say, for at least um, 5 dB over 9. Um, you know, if if we're talking, you know, five seven, five eight, and yeah, maybe, um, but yeah, five nine plus five, five nine plus ten, um, ideal, um, because there'll be no noise, uh, the audio transmission will be, will be will be crystal clear, and you'll be able to hear um, everything that's been transmitted in terms of the um, audio uh, fidelity. The X's, forget about it. Definitely not your thing. Um, if you are um, intending to burst pileups, um, is it's uh, definitely not a thing for uh, for f not intended for for the DX um, operation. I would say a lot of people will argue this point and say that you know it can be used for DX, um, and no doubt it can be used. But um, I'm just thinking that. Um, a lot of energy has been um, in DX application. Let's say it's been on, on, on ESSB signals has been wasted on the on the high and the bottom end, um, and you're not going to be heard uh, very well. Um, and in a pileup situation, you're definitely not going to have a chance. Um, and I've tried it before myself, um, and the, the the difference that I've got in terms of the the amount of people I can work on 2.8 versus 4.5 is just amazing. So, um, yeah, with a new solar cycle on a, on a, on an incline, maybe that's going to change things. I haven't seen the um, the good old times or the last solar cycle, so I can't really um, uh, comment on that. 95% um, of the the, the ham population, regardless of where you are in Australia or not, will be um, TXing and or transmitting and receiving on I would say approximately 2.6 kilohertz wide and receiving in the same fashion. And again, they won't be able to hear your high fidelity sound. Um, and be prepared uh, to be told that you sound like woof woof <laughs> and uh, to be criticized for your TX bandwidth. You know, I've received a number of um, messages and warnings and um, on air, off air, um, 
saying that you know I'm not going to make a lot of friends transmitting 4 kilohertz wide. But again, um, you just need to be uh, mindful of people around you um, and make sure that you play um, wide um, uh, ESSB when the conditions permit. Okay, so why ESSB? It's a personal choice. Um, and please remember that audio is uh, extremely subjective. It's almost like I, I like red, you like blue. It's just another mode, so it's same as CW, FT8, RTTY, EME, etc. Um, and whatever you do, please remember to acknowledge others. Like I said before, if there is a contents on and you see, you know, uh, hundreds of signals around you, don't don't try playing YTX because um, you're not going to be um, liked um, a lot. Um, and um, obviously. Um, do that when the when the conditions permit when the band is band is empty uh, do it per perhaps on the band edges where you're not in interrupting with with anybody else um and you you're not splattering onto um, people nearby but at the end of the day i think essb is um, is about experimentation which is the the core of um, amateur radio um hobby um, and you should remember to have fun and uh, never stop experimenting. In terms of the um, um, ESSB, I think it's important to mention also that apart from the, the high fidelity um, of the processed audio, um, it's important to mention that ESSB operators are very um, persistent and very adamant on, 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 on on uh, transmitting a very clean signal. Uh, when I say clean signal, I refer to um, IMD free, uh, well, minimal IMD um, in the TX um, audio. Um, and experimentation with the SSB will definitely make you a better operator um, because you'll be you'll be facing a number of challenges, um, and one of some some of them would be um, um, RFI suppression. So obviously, um, Stry RF coming back into the shack and getting into your audio, um, cabling, um, grounding techniques, um, <coughs> and of course, in-depth uh, um, equipment adjustment, uh, as well as many other factors that lead to a high quality signal. This will definitely expand your knowledge uh, and harness skills otherwise not realized with simple plug and play SSB operations practiced by most. All right, so I think that is that is the end of my presentation. Um, again, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. And oh yes, that's right. Thank you, Grant. No, <laughs> that's it. Um, all right, so um, just a, um, a bit of instruction. Um, we are going to play about a minute and a half of the ESSB. Um, audio transmission recorded live off, off air, um, just uh, um, um, uh, two stations from USA. And um, um, if you are really willing to hear uh, the high fidelity that these people um, are broadcasting, uh, put your headphones on, because if you listen to this on your, on your phone or out of the computer speakers or something like that, you're not going to be able to hear the, the true representation of the audio quality. So here we go, the, the sample of the uh, um, true uh, extended SSB, and that was recorded at 4.5 kilohertz. Just think, though, dude, uh, just think about, uh, oh, man, uh, 40 meters or, or even 10 meters. Uh, I mean, a 30 or a 40 over signal on that band, absolutely quiet. It's going to be, it's going to be illegal. As a vac. You know Paul. Paul's going to be, uh, you know, he's going to hear this and go insane. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm recording it right now, so I'm just trying to get my level set. And it's a little screwy at first, but we got uh, we, 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 we got it going on. That's right. That's right. He, he's going to nut up and, and have a cow, so that, that'll be good. We'll have to send that to him, email him. And, uh, and tell him, say, look, man, here, here's here's the nuts uh, in, in the bag right here. And, you, you need to get off, get off your rear end, and 
and then get your butt back on the air so we can so we can play some audio. I see it. I see it. All right, and that concludes our presentation for tonight. Thank you once again. And I'm pretty sure Graf will ask if there's any questions. Okay, well, I'm afraid I'm not going to easily able to take... What's going on there? Okay, um, so I'm afraid I'm not going to take questions from YouTube tonight. We're not quite that organised, but I can take them from Zoom and also from the hall here, so... If um, you want to grab the other camera, if there's any questions, first of all, from the room. Oh, not you, Matthew. <laughs> okay, I will send the microphone back. Oh, you would. Where is he? You're on, Matthew. Yeah, no problems. Thanks, Ivan, for the uh, for the talk tonight. Um, <coughs> the only question I had, Ivan, um, um, just how much of a slippery slope was the rack mount of equipment that you have in your shack? When you say slippery slope, you refer to dollars. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Well, like I said before, um, the setups um, can cost, I would say, let's say from from one thousand dollars to ten grand, easy. Yeah, and um, if if I'm, well, I mentioned the multi-band compressors, for example, before, um, which is the way to do it because you control each segment of the bottom, mid, and high. Um, the the mid-range multi-band compressor alone will be two thousand dollars. That's just one component. The preamps, if you're gonna go Neve, a Rupert Neve, you're gonna cost five thousand dollars alone. Yeah, well, a quick search on eBay just a second ago for the uh, Symmetrics uh, channel strip was about four hundred dB. So, uh, <laughs> no, uh, and, and we started seeing them at four thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars as well. We no, went, Symmetric, Ooh. Symmetric is cheap. I've, yep. I've bought one recently for for three hundred and fifty bucks. Mm. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. So, but, but they don't make them anymore. They're hard to, hard to get by. But if you see one, buy it. It's a good piece of kit. No worries, thanks. Okay, do we have any other questions? Down the front over here. Oh, hi, thanks. Uh, just for the unwashed, uh, how you covered a fair about transmitting. Um, what about receiving? Obviously, there's filters are going to be uh, wider, but any comments just on perhaps how in a normal shack we might in try and get a little bit uh, from E SSB that uh, well, if you follow what I mean. Yes. Uh, you mean in, as in the the quality of the audio then? Yeah well to appreciate the quality you guys are transmitting, how can we do that yeah. without but the first having thing the same sort of gear? The the, fir the first thing is you you got you're gonna wind up your your, your RX bandwidth. Um, I think the most receivers would with 3.6 and above. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're stuck with your filter and your rig. If yeah, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, um, but look, you can you can still um, EQ the the, the um, receive signal. My receive signal still comes through the rack. So most of the components you would have seen over there, most of them are two channels. So in one component you will have, for the stereo reasons, you know, they'll they'll give you two inputs. So I would use one for the TX, one for the RX, um, coming in. And again, how long is a piece of string? You can you can monitor it through a studio monitors, which we're going to give you a very good representation of what it sounds, without any coloring, um, or you can you can color it with, with a bit of EQ to make it a bit a bit more pleasant for the ears. Yeah. You can run two channel double side band. Yeah. Really upset. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Okay. Do we have any other questions on the floor? Otherwise, I'll throw it over to Zoom. Is there anybody on Zoom who'd like to ask a question as well? I can confirm that it's a, uh, a massive rabbit hole. Um, with that? equipment and uh, stuff like that, it's, um, uh, it's very, very interesting, actually. And I've actually found the best way to listen to it um, is on a uh, SDR where you can uh, move out the... Um, uh, the transfer, the uh, received bandwidth, and uh, some people sound really, really good. But probably the best thing uh, to get out of this is that 
there are so many people on air on amateur radio, and I find that, especially in Australia, they've actually got awful, awful, awful audio. Um, <laughs> Go on 40 metres of an afternoon and you'll hear them. It's just terrible. So I think it's pretty important. You don't have to go the full SSB hog, but uh, just care about your um, your transmitted audio. Listen to it, record it, um, and you'll uh, you'll learn a lot. Well said, Andy. Um, Steve here, five SFA. Look, just a couple of comments. Um, I'd have to th thank you for the presentation. Um, EQ. If you want to improve things, cut. If you want to change things, boost. Mm. So that's, that's a really good way of looking at it, I think. Um, and if you, if you follow it that way, um, you, you'll probably get to where you want to go pretty quickly. Well, I guess that blends into the second thing. Um, audio is very subjective. And at the end of the day, the person that you've got to please is yourself. Yep. Um, some traps that I've heard when people are playing on the air with this, you know, the, the person that's trying to get their audio right is just so dependent on other people giving them their subjective opinion. And, man, that can just lead you around and around and around in circles. Um, one technique that I use, um, and I'll just throw it out there for people who want to experiment in this space, and it's exactly, um, again, what um, Ivan did. You, you, you basically... Uh, get a separate independent receiver and a software to find one is an excellent choice and, and, and make sure it's fit for purpose, you know, like, like a, an SBI or, 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 a, or the like. Um, obviously attenuate the RF correctly so you're not overloading it in any way. Um, and take the output of that receiver and feed it into a, a digital um, audio recorder, a, a really good free one is Audacity. It's a multi, multi-track recorder um, and don't try and monitor the audio in real time yourself. Um, it's another big trap that people make because it's very, very hard um, to gain those skills to really listen to what's coming back whilst you're actually speaking. You, you, you've got a lot of um, audio that's being transferred from your voice via your jaw back to your, to your inner ear and, and you can get some interesting phased cancellations and things and that can lead you up the garden path. So the technique I use um, is you uh, transmit, record it off the air in the, in the setup that I just described, and then instantly play it back. So, you, you know, you'd say, testing one, two, three, four, five, hit the play button and hit it straight back. And you just keep doing that over and over again, just little adjustments of little things, and suddenly, again, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get the audio where you need it to be. Probably the last tip that, that, that works really well for me and again, this works purely uh, with any sort of SDR that's got a, a, a panafall display or a waterfall, whatever you want to call it. But especially where you can look at the actual RS spectrum within the audio passband. So you zoom in on, on, your, on your signal. Um, just as a, a really good place to get it sounding into a bit of a sweet spot is to just get it flat across the top. Um, that's always a good place to start. And then from there, you can either cut or boost, depending if you want to uh, improve or change, uh, dependent on your voice. And, and that usually gets in the zone pretty fast. So um, they're probably just a couple of little tips that I use that maybe could help others when you're playing in this really interesting world um, of ESSB. Thank you, Steve. And um, I just need to add to that. Um, I think that you are the one that prompted me to, to do that setup with fitting the the radio straight into the SDR one afternoon when I spoke with you on the phone. So I've, I've st stuck with that with that technique and it works really well. And if you try to listen to yourself while you're talking, it's, uh, that's going to drive you up the wall within 15 seconds <laughs> because <laughs> it's just uh, n not, not fun, not fun. And the other thing I wanted to say is I've, I've got a lot of experience, probably, I don't know, 20 years in recording, you know, guitars, drums, vocals, stuff like that. And I know how to make... Um, that sort of sound, I wouldn't say, you know, pro, pro, but I would say pretty good. Um, but the, the confusion there is that you make a sound, um, yourself sound <coughs> with your headphones almost perfect. Like you've got no complaints about anything. You're thinking, well, this is going to sound amazing. And then you play it on, the, on air and you sound absolutely like crap. <laughs> and uh, the difference there is that you're listening to yourself on a 
pair of headphones at 20 kilohertz wide, <laughs> which you know gives you a false representation of what's going to come out of your radio. So that's why the importance of monitoring the transmission straight out the an antenna port is the best way to do it. Thank you, Steve. Okay, do we have any other questions from Zoom? Any other questions from the floor? Yes, back over here, Andy. Uh, yeah, um, have you tried to go wider on 10 metres where we are allowed to go wider? Um, that's a good question. The widest I've transmitted was 6, 6.5. Not that I couldn't have done 10, I can do 10 on Sun SDR, but um, I never had any, any play buddies to do 10. <laughs> um, I've got a group, some very small group of um, friends, a um, couple of them from Adelaide, a couple of them from Victoria, that we normally play ESSB, I would say on 80 metres primarily, um, and um, sometimes 160 we will do probably 6.5 because it's not as crowded band as, as, as 80, but we have caused some, uh, some dramas where people were texting me saying, you're not going to make friends by transmitting 6K wide on, on 80 metres, even though if the band's empty. So some people get upset. <laughs> so to answer your question, imagine doing 10 kilohertz wide. <laughs> but what really gets me, Zandy, sorry, um, is that people are upset, upset with me transmitting 6K wide on a single side band, but they're absolutely fine with people doing um, AM transmission on 7.125 in the middle of the band, 40 meters which is 4K each side, which is 8 kilohertz. So they've got no issues with that. Anyway. All good, thanks. Okay, Ivan, any other questions? Yeah, Ivan, I'm just wondering um, how much um, you've mucked around with microphones. Uh, good question. Um, fair bit. Um, I can tell you that I've started with, um, I had a, um, a Rode NT1 which is a condenser microphone, and uh, but that one that one would pick up noise from 500 meters away. So you need to have a very good acoustic treatment in, in your in your shack um, if you're going to run condensers. Um, and then I realized that the dynamic is the way to go in terms of the the, the broadcast. Um, so then I started with with the lower end, and I ended up with RE20 and RE27, um, and I have them both. Um, and I think that RE27 from Electro Voice is my ultimate choice for the broadcast. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. There's a, um, I'd have to agree with you there. There's a, a very, very good um, uh, thing online. I can't remember where, but it's Bob Heil talking about why you should never use a condenser microphone on amateur radio. Mm. Um, and that's uh, one thing that I've learned too is... Um, yeah, as you were saying before, a um, condensable pickup, you know, your son's wearing it um, fortnight, three rooms away and, and what have you. But, um, yeah, so I uh, actually use a, a Rode um, uh, broadcaster here and I find that yeah. uh, very, very good. Very popular um, yep. amongst the, the radio users. I've, I've got a few mates who have the Procaster and Podcasters and, you know, whatever they call them. There's a couple of different yep. types in, in Rode, but... Obviously, yep. Rod is, is is very good and, and Aussie made, so I was happy to see yep. Rod. Yeah, there's a reason why um, radio stations use RE20s and uh, yes. SM7Bs and, and stuff yeah. because you know they're they're great. There's a few Sennheisers that are, that I would like to have, um, but let's just say that they they cost a fair bit of money, so uh, they do. They I do. Need to ask my wife for permission first. I think even Steve runs an SM7B, don't you, Steve? Yeah, I do, and and, and what what a perfect segue. Um, the other thing you've got to consider here, especially with the condensers, is to run some sort of windscreen or pop filter uh, because the other artifact that you will get with um, uh, the, the letter P or anything with a high ballistic um, is you can, get yeah, you can get supersonic pulses that will really upset your compression and you won't be able to even hear them. Uh, have a good windscreen and um, it gets rid of all of those problems for you. And uh, I, I'm open to suggestions because um, I think my wife said to me a number of times that if I hear you one more time saying testing one, two, one, two, I'm going to kill you. Can I test with something else? <laughs> testing three, four. 
Well, that, yeah. that was actually my comment in a way. Yeah, they want to play around with, with these things. I've run music for it. Okay, on dummy load, not to air. You're not on 27 megs. Yes. So uh, have you done that? And music? Yeah. No, your favourite song? You know what it sounds like? You play it back through your system and you think, well, you can tell how good your own quality is just... Uh, you probably can do that. You're right. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. What, yeah. White or pink noise is another very effective um, method. Explain, Steve, please. Steve, oh, can you elaborate? Uh, technical issues. You're muted, Steve. Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, so white or pink noise generators just ban just create full band uh, noise. Um, so it's every single frequency. Um, so really, really good for just um, setting up your EQ and having a look at, you know, what's being notched out, what's being um, boosted. Um, you know, we, we talked about EQ. We weren't being very defined here. Um, I mean, there's graphic which we're all sort of used to. It's you know, multiple bands and the like. Um, but then we haven't even touched on parametric, which is a whole different way of, of, of actually EQing because you'll have certain bands and you can change the bandwidth and you can change the boost or cut. It's a, it's a whole other world. So, um, you know, you can buy little white and pink noise generators for your smartphone for a couple of bucks. Um, and again, um, very good to... to um, just gets you in the ballpark because it's a, it, it just transmits a constant power um, with the white noise just across the whole frequency band and then with pink it's, um, it's got a slope, I forget what it is. But anyway, that's another technique. Good, thank you. I think that the, um, I, I said this at the, at the very beginning, there's no way, you know, we, we could be here sitting for five days talking about, you know, various concepts that, that, that people, you know, deploy in not just the SSB but in, in processing audio um, and I think audio processing is a, it's a science on its own so uh, um, it's, a, it's a very broad broad subject. Okay well I think we're just about at the end of the questions. One last call. Is there any questions here in the room first of all? No? Anybody else on Zoom? One more question. Um, one of the things that Paul Lawson talks about for AM broadcasts is um, how wide the signal is and when they're tuning their antennas, obviously the stuff right at the end um, can be outside the effective pass band of the antenna if the Q is too high. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with things like further down the RF chain like uh, antenna tuners or other things like that where you're pushing more RF through their power amplifiers, um, that other gear that's expecting, you know, a, a less than 3k signal is now dealing with something that's much wider and if you're tuning up on something it's the, the you're going to be, be clipping off the edges of those signals because the yeah i know what you mean um but to be honest with you and i'm not sure if this is my display displaying my um, lack of knowledge in, in in that department um i don't think my amplifier has complained so far i do have an antenna tuner but i don't use it i like to have my antennas resonant or there by or close by to the residency um, but in, um, um, I have um, um, experienced some issues where with underdriving or overdriving your audio in, in terms of the RF that feeds the, um, the amplifier, especially monitoring the ALC scale. So underdriving is obviously not good and overdriving is not good either, so you're going to have to find a happy medium. Um, yeah. yeah. There was one point that um, Paul was making to me when he spoke to me earlier today on the phone, um, and that was, first of all, one of the problems was antenna bandwidth. Oh, okay. So normally your antenna bandwidth, and, and what you've probably been doing is fine. On the broadcasters, they certainly have problems with the towers are simply not wide enough okay. um, with the tuning circuits in them, um, and that's been a problem. The other thing I know, Paul, if he's, he's probably online watching and he wasn't able to uh, to come down tonight, but he did mention that um, they've, they've used DSSB over amateur radio in years gone by. Um, and one of the particular exercises he's told me about is they actually um, used um, enhanced SSB um, to feed over 20 metres from uh, the very first 747 to fly into Adelaide um, from Singapore. Um, and they were actually on 20 metres being relayed out through the ABC. Okay. Um, and they, they pr and, he, and he processed the audio up. Um, they were actually using a technique where they shifted the audio up 300 hertz and then shifted it back down afterwards. Mm. to actually get the, uh, the bandwidth to go through the radios. 
but they were doing effectively broadcast quality interviews um, th- to the ABC studios mm-hmm. um, via 20 meter amateur radio. Cool. Um, so yeah, this this ESSB isn't necessarily a new thing. There's there's been people playing with it for of course for 30, yeah, 30, 40 years. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I know Paul particularly wanted me to mention that one. So. All right. Could I just add one more thing? Sorry, just one thing Certainly. piggybacks on. Now, this is probably more for Kim. Um, look, and this was the one night where this particular group that Ivan was referring to playing on ESSB, and I was one of them, and we were on 160 metres. I was on my magnetic loop, and um, I went to a wider bandwidth, and my amplifier instantly tripped out on VSWR because my magnetic loop is only good for three kilohertz of audio bandwidth. So the moment I went into ESSB, just wouldn't work anymore. So um, it, it, it's, it's, it's all to do with that. And Grant, the other thing Paul Lawson would have said to you, especially uh, in the medium wave broadcasting world, is one of the things that we do uh, to the big monopole um, antennas is we skirt them. So we'll add a great big spreader at the top, you know, two or three metres across, and we'll run wires, normally three wires down the side of the tower to actually get the 18 kilohertz of bandwidth that you need for a, for a normal um, medium wave AM signal. Uh, that's, uh, that's exactly what he's talking about because a, an antenna with a, with, a, with a narrow bandwidth will colour the audio. It will add distortion and there's no distortion whatsoever in the audio chain. It all becomes distortion um, on the modulated signal. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what Paul was talking to us about. Okay. Um, well, we might leave it there. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, for joining in. For the uh, the ARIG members, uh, stay on the line. We'll have a business meeting afterwards. But uh, for now, we'll sign off on YouTube. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, hopefully Hayden can tell us how many people we had out there um, when he gets back from playing soccer later tonight. So uh, good night to everybody on YouTube from the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group.